Trails. Have you ever spent hundreds of hours into some generic online multiplayer games and got nothing out of it but frustration and regret? It's a circumstance many of you might also identify with, especially in today's age in which online gaming keeps on growing and for many, offline experiences tend to become less of a matter to invest your personal time into. For me, it's become considerably more difficult to actually finish games I started with and that is really sad honestly. The magic has slowly worn off and backlogs just keep piling up to an extent that it starts to feel like actual work. Elden Ring, for a quick recent example, while still being a phenomenal game, was something I got sated of its sheer quantity eventually, and right before the end I just stopped. It's crazy really, but I know I will be up for it again in a year or so, and I don't want to spoil the rest for me by forcing myself through at the moment. In comparison, this whole ordeal might make it sound ridiculous that there is a franchise that I, upon discovery, willingly, gladly and with no second thought put up to 800 hours into basically sucking in everything it had to offer in a short amount of time and in the end I am longing for even more. Not many things can do that, but Trails did. Like a can of ravioli, I do enjoy my fair share of JRPGs once in a while, every second year or so and then that itch has been scratched. As the circumstances of the year 2020 affected us all in a way, I happened to have a lot more time on my hands in which the stars aligned and the urge arose to kneel deep into this genre again. The box of Pandora I have opened back then. From now on I will probably sound like a guy in a suit on the stage of E3 saying things about their latest AAA title, so take care. Battlefield 1. No ordinary game. An absolutely mind-boggling pitch. An epic and unforgettable experience. While it looks like nothing revolutionary on the outside, Trails is, as the name suggests, taking you down the line for an adventure. Trails, that is known as Kiseki in Japan and branched out of the Legend of Heroes franchise, has a different design philosophy behind it than other titles in its genre. Everything wants to tell a compelling story, more or less, but Neon Falcom, the developers behind Trails, take this to a whole different level. Something no existing video game media has come close to up until now, or even will in the near future. I can even say that it surpasses the standards of visual novels, the genre that is exclusively dedicated to the storytelling aspect. Until now, over the course of about one and a half decades, Trails has established and unraveled an interconnecting, coherent and continuous plot starting with Trails in the Sky in 2004, up to Trails of Cold Steel 4 in 2018, the last game that got localized in the West up until this point. The games are divided into several story arcs, with each game and arc telling their own self-contained stories and following their own respective cast and locations. In the end though, it is this sweet overarching narrative that binds everything together and forms this huge puzzle picture that you gradually become familiar with. It's a commitment to world building and storytelling that you normally only get out of book series or maybe television shows. This opens up the possibility to create deep, comprehensive and especially conceivable lore that, once it piqued your interest, just won't let you off anymore as you've become eager to know what happens next. Most games have always been restricted to put their lore into a single title and therefore naturally need to set their boundaries from early on as possible. The information density is much tighter. While this is pretty much standard procedure and nothing to criticize about whatsoever given how the conditions are, you still can't help but feel a little bit too overloaded at once sometimes. Imagine you have a first date with someone called JRPG and it goes something like this. Hey. Hey, do you know that you're the Lumina? And the four crystals of life, elements, and sin have come off balance? Okay. I mean, yeah, I get it, but let's just say there's a reason why From Software's way of storytelling gained so much popularity by not forcing it onto the player. Trails contrasts this as the series' structure gives it enough room to be extensive and allows a much more comprehensible flow of events. The continent of Zemuria, in which the games are located, is a place that has been constructed with so much love, care and thought and everything that plays out in it is so believably and pleasantly written. 
It felt almost alienating for me at first getting into the series, when I saw how slowly things were proceeding and how meticulous the narrative pieces were put onto another. I mean, it's not what you usually used to, but you will eventually come to realize how important those characteristics are in terms of its design philosophy and you will learn to cherish how much significance this has in the long run. It's actually something I began to miss in other JRPGs once I've seen the other end of the spectrum. A particular thing I absolutely love is how rationally and cleverly Falcon portrays its story, since the top-notch worldbuilding done in these games so strongly emphasize the meaning and effect some moments have. As a consequence, there is a clear red thread running through an arc's theme, and story bits will have much more meaning and will appear much more logical when they start to connect to one another. It's very hard to explain things around the main story here without getting spoilery. Trails is outright notorious for having insane amounts of texts that picture this world and enhance and broaden your experience with it. Although this might implicate that you will be crushed and flooded with unending amounts of text boxes, it will never feel like a chore and in the end only serves the world building process. The unique thing is that most of this text is integrated into optional NPC dialogue. You see, one of the most prominent features in Trails is how much attention to detail they have put into NPC conversations. Even the most insignificant NPCs have their own side stories to tell and their own identity. The dialogue completely changes every time you advance the main story a tiny bit further to a great amount of times. This leads to every inhabitant in this world to feel human, to act accordingly and to not be a simple cardboard cutout. They don't just decorate the place or give the impression alone for locations to be populated, but instead complement it and make it feel more alive. That's honestly such a charming and respectable addition for content most developers wouldn't even bother with to this extent, as most players wouldn't even see it. Major characters may oftentimes resemble a standard Japanese archetype at first, I mean this is all anime and might be irritating initially. However, the series' longevity and depth give them enough room to, over several games and arcs, flesh out, grow and make you better, better understand their motivation, circumstances and predicaments. For real, those character arcs are partially so greatly executed. The Tsundere girl isn't this way just for the sake of it, but there's a logical and sound reason behind of it all. There is a stunning explanation why the robotic and emotionless girl became the way she is right now, and there is history for why this guy is so rough to everyone around him, just to name a few. And it all works so exceptionally well, because it purposefully synergizes with the world building done on the side of it all. As I have briefly touched upon previously, referencing and bringing back concepts from past titles is another important feature in Trails of Storytelling design, and makes you go Mm. Every time you recognize something familiar. For a quick illustration, let's take a look at the beginning of Treads of Cold Steel. It is a foreshadowing segment of what is about to happen later in the game. When you go into this completely blind as your first Trails game, you won't know what the f*** is going on, why is it already escalating so hard, what are all these options, I have no idea what I'm doing, but you don't need more essentially. There's this bunch of students entering and fighting through this hijacked military base in order to stop a weapon of mass destruction. In the scope of Trails of Cold Steel on its own, that's more than enough for this point in time. Coming to this scenario after finishing all the preceding titles sheds a totally different light onto it. Why is it already escalating so hard? You will exactly know what this place is, you can pinpoint it on the timeline of events, you know exactly what these things are, you will know what that tower is, <coughs> and you will have a hunch that there is something not right with its closing moments. Stop! Stop! While this referencing and putting together the bigger picture is the bread and butter of trails later down the line, and is what really keeps you invested, it also comes with the matter of accessibility, and with accessibility, the burdens this series has to carry. You are probably wondering why, despite me giving it all the glory here, chances are that you have never even heard of it before and how can that be if it's supposed to be so good. Going with the accessibility part first, 
The way I've talked about it before suggests that Trails must be played in chronological order. Additionally, taking on this whole series is a huge commitment with 9 games so far that in combination may be deterrent to new players and understandably so. The other main reason is the grim fate Trails had and still has to suffer from localization. The first three games, the Sky Trilogy, had their debut in a time in which the internet was only beginning to be a common part of our lives and word about products like these only hardly got around. Especially Trails in the Skies translation was afflicted by additional hindrances that only delayed the procedures. By the time it finally found its way into the west, it already fell into oblivion and to this day remains to be an overlooked part of a niche series. The two successors, the Crossbell duology, had it even worse, as they have never been officially released in the West and were only playable with a high quality fan translation patch. It's absolutely remarkable what amount of dedication and effort fans have put into this project to make the Crossbell games accessible for the entire community, and I can only endorse it. Fact is though, that the official releases are coming now, this and next year, and are actually based on those fan translations, whose team is cooperating with the publisher to make this finally a reality. From Trails of Cold Steel onwards, localization usually takes about 1-2 to two years of time, since there is so much text to translate, but at least now the procedures are consistent. It is really sad and unfair in my opinion. Falcom undoubtedly puts all of its available resources, dedication and determination into their games and nevertheless most of them go without the credit they would ultimately deserve, all while these issues don't degrade its objective quality. To put a close to this segment, all these design elements I've explained before culminate into an enormous and never seen before project in the video game industry, for which Falcom is putting so much faith and devotion into what they are doing here and underline the goal they have in mind for this series, to, I quote, create the most ambitious story in gaming, with Falcom's president, Toshihiro Kondo, deeming it to be his life's work. Next, I want to give a rough outline to the series' available games and arcs. Please keep in mind that I can only scratch on the surface here, as to not give too much away. The first arc is the Laburl arc and consists of a trilogy, Trails in the Sky 1st chapter, 2nd chapter and Trails in the Sky the 3rd. 1st chapter and 2nd chapter on the one hand are directly linked and transition seamlessly into another, while the 3rd on the other hand is more like an epilogue to the first two games that has its own detached storyline but sticks to what happened in 1st chapter and 2nd chapter before. The trilogy takes place in the country of Laburl that is located on the southwestern coast of Zamoria in a pocket between two major superpowers, the Arabonian Empire to the north and the Republic of Kelva to the east. Laburl is visually oriented towards the template of a technologically advanced European medieval infrastructure and personally reminded me of Alexandria from Final Fantasy IX. Both are a monarchy, there are castles, transport airships and those half-timbered houses are once made out of marble. It gives off this distinct high fantasy feeling more than any other place within Zemuria. In fact, it's one of the attributes I remember Treads in the Sky primarily for. You are Estelle Bright, a young junior bracer in training and form a pair with her adoptive brother Joshua Bright in the same profession. The Bracer Guild is an international organization operating across the continent that ensures that civilians, that stand in their hierarchy above anything else, are protected and helped with when in need. Various requests that may range from monster exterminations, retrieval or bodyguard missions, or advice offerings, just to name a few, can be put up at a nearby branch of the guild that the Bracers subsequently take care of. Estelle's and Joshua's work as junior bracers requires them to travel all across the country and while having a relatively minor goal in mind at first, they get drawn into a grander and more sinister scheme along the way. Trails in the Sky's most defining element here is in what way it spirals into this crazy and unexpected turn of events. It starts off by being relatively innocent at first. 
In fact, the beginning section is well known to be an infamous slow burn, and then gradually delves into the mad stuff bit by bit. Just look at the composition of both game covers. Putting this a bit further, I think this isn't for the purpose to convey the tone of the story in that way alone. As being the opening in the entire series, fundamentals have naturally to be established first, and that's something you will notice. Falcon made sure to take you by your hand and let you get comfortable with this universe first and foremost, to let you ascertain how things are operating at a pleasant pace. Looking at the global Steam achievements, you can see that a lot of people took issue with that, since not even half of those who bought first chapter managed to finish the prologue. This isn't something that will give you an imminent neurological overload like Call of Duty, but instead aims to build up on something in the long run. Around chapter 2 and 3, the plot increasingly begins to thicken and you should be more inclined to decide whether to keep being invested into the matter or not. The ending of first chapter is one of the greatest plot twists in the series and is what ultimately opens the book of the characteristic overarching narrative of the series. Especially into second chapter, things tend to become very emotional and intricate and I just couldn't stop playing as I definitely had to see this through. Each arc has got this sort of underlying theme going for it, and for the Le Burl arc it is this intense and sentimental adventure you simply won't forget. What's with the third game in the mix you may wonder and being restricted on what to talk about here, this one is rather hard to tackle. Trails in the Sky the Third is a mystery box. In scope of the entire series so far, it's particular in many ways and got a mixed reception within the community. What separates it so strikingly from the rest is the fact that the third is mainly constrained to be a dungeon crawler. Dungeon crawlers on their own have their enthusiasts and it is not my intention to talk down on it, but for Trails that has an entirely different goal in mind, this design choice proved to be rather questionable. There is a self-contained story told in the third and it's... Okay, but nothing more. Without giving away too much, I want to throw the term confinement into the room and that is something that helps to create unique and compelling interactions that are more easily remembered than the main story here, in my opinion. Despite that, the third is very special in a different way. It's sort of like the super secret bonus disc. Sprinkled throughout the game, there are key concepts introduced and key outlooks presented that are utterly crucial for the overarching plot Trails is trying to tell. It prepares for the Crossbell arc, it teases the main idea for the Erebonia arc that only gets resolved after 11 years, or in other words, 6 games later. I'm almost sure there have been topics that have yet to gain much more relevance in the future of the series, and astonishingly were included so early in the process of writing. Combat is turn-based and takes place on a grid, with the battle order being visible on the left. Turns can be accompanied by various bonuses that are granted to the respective unit that's taking action. Encounters are visible on the overworld and the way you engage can either benefit you or the enemy. In battle, the most noteworthy options that may differentiate from other RPGs are, on the one hand, crafts, that are unique moves of an individual character and consume craft points. And on the other hand, arts, that represent the magic system here, take some turns to cast and consume energy points. Spells that become available as an art stem from a device called an Orbman system that makes use of the concept of orbital energy, which is like the electronic power system of this universe. Orbman systems run on quartz, which are processed masses of elemental fragments that not only provide you with additional attributes, but also determine which kind of arts you are able to use in battle and correspond to fixed formulas you can check up on from the start. 
Each open system is set up differently, with some restrictions here or there, and the line structures give away how much a character is going to lean on arts, since more powerful arts require higher sums of elements in a single line. I really like the idea of this whole concept. Setting up the augment systems and placing quartz pieces around is kind of a strategic inventory and resource management that demands some thought and logic from the player. Apart from that, having a scientific system that draws out the potential and energy out of elements and converts them into an otherworldly force or power is a refreshing take since you normally know this kind of stuff in being obscure magic or sorcery that somehow draws out its resources from a mana or ether pool or something like that. From second chapter on out, Estelle's augment and stats, because she's the main character I guess, and to give the player more room in what to do with her, is relatively balanced out. This has always bugged me, because that led to her not being able to excel on anything in particular. I don't like how you can't assign her to a specific fighting style and instead she's more like this fluid character that could on paper do everything. The game is even somewhat aware of that so yeah. But you know there is a thing that you can and on the higher difficulties absolutely must abuse and who may be best suited for that. Earthwall is an art that grants complete immunity to any damage source once and sadly, combat in the late game, especially with bosses, is heavily reliant on that, for in any other case you can prepare yourself to be one shot into next week. And this in turn leads to this weird stacking, positioning and damaging pattern with arts only, because if one party member leaves the range of Earthwall, doesn't get the shield and gets knocked out, you're forced to disband this formation to revive, which in return opens you up to new attacks and so forth. It's something that really sticks out when you have the later titles to compare, as they did fix this there. Coming back to your options in battle, there are also S-Crafts, which are like ultimate abilities and can be used with more than 100 craft points available to a cap of 200 at max. As crafts can also be, and it is strongly advised to do so, regardless of the battle order force commanded to be executed in the following turn, called an S-break. S-breaks make it possible to specifically target battle order bonuses and benefit from them, or otherwise incorporate a strategic method of counterplay. Combat in Trails has a certain depth to it with factoring in things like elemental weaknesses, resistances, applying buffs and debuffs and positioning. More powerful arts target an area of effect, and naturally, you'd like to dodge them if you can. Looking back at Trails in the Sky, the combat yet appears as only very basic and is the foundation on which new additions and tweaks have been added on game by game, and for that, I still respect it for what it once was, even if it's been a bit finicky here or then. What I totally give it credit for is that you actively have to make inputs and in that sense pull your own weight. This statement now may sound a bit weird and you may not exactly know what I mean by that. Playing Nino Kuni 2 on the normal difficulty some time ago has moderately traumatized me, or was it even on hard? I don't know anymore for sure, when I realized that you could literally go into battles, do nothing like controller on the side and you would still win by a long shot. Complete deal breaker for me. The soundtrack is outright amazing. It underlines the fantasy ambience with a diverse collection of these kinds of dreamy, warm and playful tracks many old school JRPGs are known for. The sky theme in the title, the covers and artworks and Le Burl itself with its name and metaphorically the falcon on its crest were obviously all meant to symbolize freedom and serenity and it really reflects in the music. When I listen to specific pieces, I feel like a child again that played the game back in the day, which is ironic since I actually played it as an adult. As cheerful as the soundtrack can be, it also contrasts heavily when those values become endangered over the course of the story and things descend into chaos. It serves the purpose well and were cleverly put into practice.
talking about the music, it is also important to mention the relevance of light motifs. Trails of Soundtrack offers multiple of those, with some of them so distinct and apparent that you can easily recognize them in totally different tracks. They will burn into your memory and you can effortlessly connect them to specific places, concepts or organizations linked to it. If I go to this online keyboard for example and push a few notes like this, I'm sure people who know the series will have a certain name popped up into their heads right now. That just speaks of quality in my opinion and shows that the composers definitely have their way with music. I catch myself whistling to some of them on occasion even nowadays. And that's it for the Le Beurl arc pretty much. What came to follow it up, and that's by the way something you will see over the course of this video, is the focus on a specific location that was, in many ways, going to be a major centerpiece. Welcome to Crossbell City. Oh Crossbell, the city of sin, where should I start with you? Formalities first, the Crossbell arc is a duology of Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure and as stated before has only been released in Japan in 2010 and 2011 respectively. In my opinion, Crossbell is Falcom's magnum opus and I think they know that perfectly well. It is epic, and yes I said epic because I really mean it here and not in the way it has been slandered over the years by profusely sticking it on every piece of media that is above average. This is epic. I love the city, I love the story, I love the characters, I love the music, and I love the key role it has and I think that no book, no movie, no show, no game or nothing that can be consumed in any way will get me to this state of ecstasy again I felt when I played through those two games. Not even the birth of my future child, if there'll ever be one, will ever come close to this. It is an absolute crime to humanity that this has been withheld from the rest of the world for so long. Forget Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, Final Fantasy, 6 and 7, Paper Mario, Xenoblade Chronicles, Nier Automata and Persona 5, the Crossbell duology as a standalone would outshine every single one of them and should have been in their place and have their reputation instead if it had been given a proper chance. It's not the Joker or the hero that should have been in Smash and not even Estelle as Trails' mascot but Lloyd Bennings being the 20th character with a downbeat counter. It should have been the demon souls of story RPGs back then when so many people in the west were so religiously importing it from Japan and if it had gained just a little more popularity like that I'm sure that YouTube would be flooded with analysis, praises and fan content like with Ocarina of Time, Dark Souls or Resident Evil 4. <gasps> Here, this is me playing the last chapters of Trails to Azure and this is what I was sounding like. Anyway, if you think LeBurl has a tough being under constant pressure from two superpowers then you've seen nothing yet. Crossbell lies at the convergence point between the front borders of the Erebonian Empire to the west and the Republic of Calvert to the east and is a small autonomous city-state that only exists after they granted it at some point in the past. As a consequence, higher political levels are directly influenced by both countries as they suggestively like to lay claim to it again in the long run. These complicated and complex affairs led to Crossbell becoming prone to corruption and illicit activity. You are Lloyd Bennings and return to Crossbell after graduating Police Academy in order to start work at the Crossbell Police Department. Upon arrival, Lloyd gets unexpectedly placed into a newly formed unit, the Special Support Section. The Special Support Section aims to be a more direct and personal approach to citizens in need, as the reputation of Crossbell's police as the executive force of the corrupt government structure suffered over time. Coincidentally, and maybe this already sounds familiar to you, this work resembles the assignments done by the Bracer Guild very closely. As Crossbell already has a guild branch to fill that need and that the citizenry in return is very fond of, this will naturally not work out as easily as intended. 
while the special support section engages in trying to maintain the city's well-being in as much as they can and in fighting against the injustice and corruption that has the city clasped in its very core, they slowly descend into several of Crossbell's endless, deep and entangled rabbit holes. Crossbell is a relatively modern and technologically advanced city. In large part it's structured in a way that familiarizes you to aspects that are or come close to those in our own world. It's the first time in any designated fantasy RPG that you can actually relate to a location more than ever because it so strongly resembles reality. It's so much easier to feel home in that sense. The world building done here is absolutely remarkable. Having only a small sized city state with the city at its center and a few points of interest around it for two games consecutively makes you move around and revisit places many times and Trails' key features take much more effect. Nothing will always be the same. Falcom wants to convey that the city is alive, that time progresses, that people are living their daily lives and that you are a part of it and it works so exceptionally well. Although Crossbell is practically a hornet's nest and a place you'd better keep away from, you will still learn to form an attachment with it. Its inhabitants who live under those bad circumstances manage to form an own identity you can get behind. The world's cast and characters were already so wonderfully written, but the Crossbell games take this to a whole nother level, as they're all in a way a necessary part and asset of the city. They all have a suitable and transparent reason to be and act the way they do, nothing that's too out of place or too one-dimensional, because they all harmonize so well together in this extraordinary melting pot that is Crossbell. Topics discussed in the games are much more adult, even breaking taboos at some points, to which I would really be surprised if the age rating of the official releases fall below 16 years or below mature in the US. Falcom had the guts to try something here and threw the stone as far as they could and that's something I respect as it worked out marvelously in the end. But it's not only the world building, the Crossbell games have the best of everything. It's got the best and most masterfully crafted narrative I have ever witnessed in any video game medium up to date. The pacing is much more forthcoming this time around than in Trails in the Sky. You will have noticed that here I had much more to say about the setting and the outline and part of the reason is because a lot more things are relayed from the very start. It's a more accessible beginning of a new arc that doesn't let players walk aimlessly around that long at first like in Sky First Chapter. You are hooked much faster into the narrative. There is a point in Trails to Azure from which it goes into full gear and just keeps unwinding and is a rollercoaster ride until the end that never stops. A particular twist has made me totally speechless. It was something you could make out as an inconsistency, something you could have easily brushed off. However, it turned out to be as intended and was even critical for the story to work out in the end. The way it was presented could only work in a game and that is just amazing. Side quests are actually fun this time. The mixture between the already familiar bracer work and a more investigative detective touch, since you are police officers, turned out to be a very enjoyable overworld experience. If I had to really search for something that I could generally criticize here as compensation, well, the visuals perhaps? But that wouldn't be fair. The Japanese writing style might have also shown through a little bit much at times, where everyone at the scene had to say something to the occasion by not saying anything at all, empty phrases so to speak, but that didn't bother me at all. In any case, I've been talking about underlying themes in each arc and for the Crossbell games it's the concept of fighting for something you hold dear. Although Crossbell is a place that is shady in many ways, you will still find aspects you're going to cherish and that you will want to see through. I just can't wait to see what Fate Falcom has in store for Crossbell in the future of the series. I want more, two games just aren't enough. Combat is mostly the same from the Sky games, but they tweaked it on the right ends. For one, there's the addition of a new nameworthy turn bonus, the option to perform an all-out attack. Yeah. 
There are also combination crafts added, in which two party members perform an action simultaneously. And support crafts, in which reserve members of the party may occasionally drop into the battle order to perform a unique move. Trails to Azure exclusively has the burst feature that becomes available during clutch moments of the story and when activated removes any debuffs and lets you gain full turn advantage until the gauge runs out. And fortunately, balancing has also been done, most notably completely removing Earth Wall and putting a slightly different art in its stead that now only blocks physical damage once. This offers far more needed liberty in fights and strategizing is much more fun as the reliable go-to tactic isn't available anymore. There have also been some quality of life features added, most notably more transparency regarding the characteristics of enemies, removing the trial and error on finding out which status effect one is susceptible to. Incredibly helpful in boss battles. Although Lloyd features the same balance stored open structure like Estelle, his role in battle has been made much more clearer. The stats and his role within the special support section indicate that he is intended to be the frontline tank. I was more comfortable with things like that to be honest, because in story heavy RPGs, it only supplements a character's personality and position. Trails to Azure was the first game to feature Master Quartz, a more powerful quartz that is put into the center of the augments and provides unique features and attributes normal quartz don't have. The soundtrack is again absolutely incredible and captures every facet Crossbell offers perfectly well. It's such a dilemma honestly, when contemplating about what pieces I can process into this video, I could literally take everything and I feel bad that I have to leave out some of them. To underline that Crossbell is a much more modernized and advanced environment, the soundtrack within the city limits is much more clearly synthesized and at times accompanied by electric guitars. It has its own reoccurring style, tone and characteristics in its many pieces and form this coherent recognizable structure. Something I want to mention in that sense and is something I can only talk about vaguely for spoiler sake and therefore is directed towards people who played the series is this specific and sad medley that didn't take precisely the same parts from the original so that you can't really pinpoint where it's taken from but rather incorporated the same features to make a reference abundantly clear. It's a leitmotif without a leitmotif, it's insane. The outskirts of the city are much more down to earth. You can easily make out individual instruments again and especially the acoustic guitar is commonly used. It's such a nice contrast. In this segment I want to highlight a single piece, namely the normal combat music in Trails from Zero. It's called Get Over the Barrier and features a distinguished melody and pace I never got tired of and made even insignificant encounters worthwhile. The name on the one hand alludes to Crossbell's aforementioned circumstances and the desire to eventually overcome them. On the other hand, this can also be interpreted into the Crossbell arc's real-life situation, in which they never got over the metaphorical barrier of localization, and I think in the light of that, it's just beautiful. After Crossbell, Falcon moved their attention to another country within Zamuria to feature their next arc, and it came to be the Erebonian Empire, a name that has been ghosting around since Trails in the Sky first chapter. So how would you possibly portray this massive military might in the most appropriate way? Well, with an anime school simulation of course. where she can see them. Oh, what happened? Huh? 
This is Trails of Cold Steel. If you ever happen to have heard of Trails before, chances are that it has been one of the Cold Steel games since those were the first ones that became more widely known in the West. Advertised as a second starting point for newcomers to this series, it wasn't only the transition to full 3D that was new here. Coming from the Liberal and Crossbell games, it was alienating to see in what direction the series is steering towards. Persona, a series that in many ways shares common design philosophies with Trails, apparently has very well been under the radar of Falcom. They took some very big notes and incorporated key features from them like attending school, a social sim system and a calendar-based story progression into their new arc, and it became the basic framework for Trails of Cold Steel to be built around. Falcom didn't go this way without any thought though. At first, I thought that they solely wanted to cater in a broader audience, while still holding true to their design ideals. And while that may still be the case to some extent, I can assure you that this design choice runs deeper than it first appears, and isn't just a mask. In fact, it's nothing less than the very DNA of the Cold Steel saga. Character development and the subject of bonding and linking to one another are deeply ingrained into the story and gameplay to which Trails of Cold Steel wouldn't even work or let alone exist without it. What Falcom did to Crossbell by making the location so amazingly multi-dimensional, they now try to convey to this new cast of characters. You are Reen, Haha Guy, Schwarzer and the 10th Force Military Academy where you will become part of Class 7, a newly formed class consisting of a diverse group of students that, aside from the other classes, focus more on the active and practical part of combat than the theoretical knowledge around it. The purpose for creating Class 7 was to test and gain data for the combat link feature of the so-called Arcus, Cold Steel's new augment system that enhances the user's battle capabilities when fighting together with an ally. For the best results, they must undergo field studies throughout their term around Arabonia, in which, surprise surprise, the assignments ominously resemble the requests done by the Bracer Guild. Over the course of the games, Reen explores the nature of the country and how it affects itself and its surroundings. The games of the Tetralogy are all different enough to be treated individually. Cold Steel 1 and 2 tell a seamlessly transitioned story that goes along with several design and gameplay elements they share. After a small break in the timeline, the story continues in the same manner with Cold Steel 3 and 4, for which they took the basis from 1 and 2 and improved it on various levels. Seriously, I cannot imagine going back to Cold Steel 1 and 2 after being accustomed to the standards 3 and 4 set for the future. So yeah, about the structure of the story, that's also something different. I don't really know where to start here, so I'll slowly try to paint a picture. Let's begin with a controversial take. I don't think that you should play the Cold Steel games for the main story. Every story that is going to be told has to eventually culminate into some sort of conclusion, obviously. Although they're only part of an entire arc, even Skyfirst Chapter and Trails from Zero left you with a false ending, something that gives you at least a little bit of satisfaction. The entirety of Trails of Cold Steel, however, doesn't, and it is genuinely insufferable on how much of a cliffhanger you are going to be left on between games, especially in the case of Cold Steel 2. That must have been infuriating to be forced to wait two years for Cold Steel 3. This in return suggests that the whole thing is building up to something huge. I mean, these are four games, you would definitely sink more than 300 hours into this. But what Trails of Cold Steel 4 comes to conclude with in the end, objectively speaking, is good and logical, but it doesn't justify the sheer length of it all and meet the expectations you will have by then. The thing is, if you would break down the plot into its most rudimentary key points, you can actually fit the whole arc into two games. But then the story wouldn't nearly have the same appeal, the same effect and the same meaning. Why is that? Normally the way the course of a story is taking is when one thing leads to another. 
When one outcome opens the door to something else. Let's take Final Fantasy VII for an example. Over the first few hours, everything that occurs in Midgar is a sequence of events that logically follow one another. And now let's look at the first trails of Cold Steel. What you're going to do for like 90% of the game, and I don't consider this as a spoiler since it really is the basic outline here, is that you're getting to know Class 7. Strictly speaking, the first major key point that can be regarded as relevant to the main plot only happens at the end of the game, and that key point, may it be a climax, a twist, a revelation, I won't say, only works so well because you so thoroughly got to know Class 7. When you go into Cold Steel 2 and the first battle hits you with the Get out of my way! Let's move! It only has that much of an effect and impact because you so thoroughly got to know Class 7. The first half of Cold Steel 2 only makes sense and can only stand because you so thoroughly got to know Class 7. And there are many other instances where these kinds of methods are the case. And here we come into what the Cold Steel games should be played for. It lives off its subplots and sub-events that supplement the world building done for these games. They're essential even though they're not directly related to the main thing, and they're not boring or a slog to go through. Never once did I sit here eye-rolling and wondering when this whole thing finally gets going. I mean, let's take the first Harry Potter part. I'm willing to bet that it's not the circumstances around the Philosopher's Stone that made it so popular, but instead the whole concept of a magic culture, the characters, Hogwarts, etc. When I think of the upcoming Hogwarts Legacy, I don't give a sh if the story was hastily clamped together on the last week of planning during toilet breaks, as long as I can realistically live a life as a pupil in Hogwarts. For many people, the Erebonia arc was their first contact to the series, and I've seen many people enjoying it as a standalone, which shows that the world building alone, the ride even though you don't know where exactly it's headed, is enough to have kept them invested. And in the end, it's even more rewarding if those are the substantial bases that the key points of the plot need. The mid-game sequence of Trails of Cold Steel 4 is one of the most powerful moments of the series, and my favorite part of the whole arc. It could only be this way because everything up to that point prepared for it and took enough time, and I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I understand what Falcom intended to achieve with this whole design, namely to put a second underline beneath the term world building and putting all of the new features I previously mentioned to that use. In the end, the journey was definitely worth it and I appreciate all of the emotional attachment I developed for all that it offers in so so much detail. I can't think of a better description of this arc's theme than this cliché meme phrase, maybe the real treasure was the friends we made along the way. Yikes! Speaking of cringe, as a little side note here, in Cold Steel 3 they thought that this scene with Reen and Elisa was so hilarious that they absolutely had to replicate this with Kurt and Yuna. Um, it was Yuna, correct? Huh? Uh -huh. My apologies, but if you could move... It's not that you're heavy, but you're I'm happy. having trouble breathing. <laughs> no. Oh god, I think a portal is opening up. Mr. Rex, sir, Hyra is mushy crush. You have your bon eyes mustache. Mithra, don't complain. I'm so like you could have been like that. Well then, history repeats itself. Combat has received a few notable additions. For one, the grid has been removed and units in battle can now freely move to precise locations on the field. Attack affinities are introduced, which classify the damage dealt into four different types. Slashing, piercing, thrusting and striking. Along with the elemental attributes, enemies are either susceptible to them or not. Hitting an enemy with the right type may cause them to become unbalanced, opening them up for a free follow-up attack from the combat link partner. Those are the benefits coming with the Arcus, for which two party members must be linked up beforehand. Follow-up attacks build up bravery points that in return can be consumed instead of a follow-up attack for a rush, in which both link partners attack simultaneously, or an all-out attack with every active party member. Additionally, reserve party members can now be switched in with an active member during battle, creating more strategical depth. 
Depending on how strong the link is between partners, they may also grant extra forms of assistance during battle, like free heals between turns or empowered follow-up attacks, just to name a few. With these features, the link system projects the heavy emphasis on solidarity onto the combat gameplay and offers benefits from active coordination. I personally liked it, it added a new much needed dynamic and battle perspective to the already enhanced visual appearance. Trails' battle mechanics had to evolve in some form at some point, as the industry only gets more modern, and this was another step in the right direction. Reen and his katana is designed to be a damage dealer, leaning more on crafts than anything else. This only suits his kit and what Falcom had in mind for him as the story progresses. What had me disappointed, however, was what they did to the quad system. For some reason, arts aren't determined by the quads' arrangement anymore, namely how they formally corresponded to specific requirements. Now arts become available through dedicated quads that hold them and can be placed wherever into the augments, it doesn't matter, or by leveling up the master quads in the center. I'm not really sure what made them do it like this, they removed a perfectly fine mechanic for no apparent reason at all. Cold Steel 3 and 4 again tweak combat on the right ends, giving it more strategical depth and visual appeal overall. It introduced the brake system, in which enemies now have an additional bar, the brake gauge. When it's depleted by attacks, for which some damage the brake gauge more than the HP bar, they get stunned, fall in the battle order and, until it's their turn again, are more vulnerable towards damage and hits always unbalance. Bosses can also now become enhanced, in which their attributes are strengthened, but a break will cancel this effect. They usually do this before performing their S-Craft, which makes it for a good indicator and wants the player to take precautions. I really like this one, because now S-Crafts from bosses can catch you off guard anymore and obliterate your entire party. This has always caused frustration before, as literally dozens of minutes into a fight it could happen out of the blue. Brave Orders are a completely new mechanic, which when activated consume a set number of Brave Points and grant special bonuses for a fixed number of turns. Each character has unique Brave Orders with varying costs that become available if they're in your party. Another neat feature implemented in Cold Steel 3 is how smooth the transition from the overworld into a battle is. The game now recognizes where you are on the map and converts this position into the battle scene. For real, I can't go back to Cold Steel 1 and 2 anymore. Coming to the soundtrack, I feel like a broken record when I say that it, again, is absolutely amazing. However, I find it difficult to summarize the nature of it this time. You have, like, everything. A completely wild and diverse palette of tracks. They conveyed what they had done before into this new generation and along with some Persona-esque J-pop gave it an overall more modern touch. There are some of the best pieces here as it appears like they took the blueprints of original tracks and put them on steroids. I just can't leave out an example even though they're technically late game stuff but you absolutely need to get a taste of it. Lastly, I want to touch on the bonding events. I'm sure that bonding events from now on will become a fixed mechanic in future games, and that's not a bad thing, after all it only serves their world building philosophy. But they need to be carefully situated as well, and throughout the Cold Steel games, a few of them were really out of place, which really broke the tension and worked almost anticlimactic in a way. I still remember a certain part in Cold Steel 3 that was leading up to a climax, just for bonding events to swoop right in before all of that. Hey, tomorrow there will be a lot of pressure onto us and we may actually die, but screw that, let's forget about that and enjoy ourselves for the night. <laughs> And I don't include what has been done at the end of Cold Steel 4 into that for anyone wondering, that one was awesome.
so the question remains on which game you can actually start with. In the end, it's your decision of course and I can only give my advice. First and foremost, it's obvious to say that only the first game of an arc can be considered. That leaves us with three games. I don't need to say any more to Trails in the Sky first chapter. It's the first game in the series and therefore the most optimal way to start. Then there's Trails from Zero. The Crossbell duology have the best overall package and are an absolutely amazing duology on their own that work without having to know what happened in the Laburl arc. It's like Better Call Saul with Breaking Bad. You can watch it independently and you will enjoy it, but the definitive experience is having that background knowledge. In that sense, you need to have in mind, and this counts for each entry from there on out, including those who aren't here yet, that you will get spoiled about certain things that happened in previous titles, and in some scenarios the games will expect you to know about them. This will obviously hinder your experience if you like what you see so far and would be willing to go back. Since the Crossbell titles will officially come to the West this and next year, I can only reinforce my heartfelt recommendation at this point. Then there's Trails of Cold Steel and this is a bit tricky in my opinion. I know that I have said that many people started here and were happy with what they got, but I wouldn't recommend it nonetheless. Trails of Cold Steel 1 is, on its own, a perfectly well entry point for newcomers. It was advertised this way when it came to the West. The problem is that finishing Cold Steel 1 predetermines you to logically follow it up with Cold Steel 2 and beyond. Thing is, the events of the Crossbell arc and the first two games of the Erebonia arc happen for the most part at the same time, leading them to be deeply intertwined and then carried on from Cold Steel 3 onwards. You will literally see endgame spoilers from Trails to Azure, the most crucial ones in fact, and I'm still surprised on how unconcealed they were presented. How's your car running? This does not only ruin a subsequent crossbell playthrough, as this amazing story should be experienced blind for its full glory, but also, as I said, what is told there will be picked up on from Cold Steel 3 onwards, making it an unofficial direct sequel. It can theoretically be played without it, but please, don't do this to yourself. I've seen people play through Cold Steel 1 first, and if they liked what they saw, went back to Sky First Chapter to catch up with the rest, and that's another perfectly fine way into this series. If you actually made it this far into the video, then I sincerely thank you for listening to my fanboyish appraisal of the Trail series. A tiny bit of aftertaste I have after writing the script is how restricted I actually felt with not being able to go into much detail and carefully moving around some topics, and I hope it didn't hurt the flow that much. I eagerly wanted to make some sort of content of it for a longer time now, for one to raise more interest to people who haven't heard of it yet but also to give the series something back. Although I've never really been that much of an RPG guy before, Trails nevertheless managed to draw me in like no other game or series has done before. It raised the bar for the standards of story and lore in general should be portrayed, and everything after that is unavoidably and unconsciously being compared to it. I tried to find something similar that can fill out that hole again that's been left after finishing all of the available titles, but so far I haven't found anything yet that came even close to it. The next game, Trails into Reverie, will come to the west anytime next year and it's going to be an epilogue to both the Erebonia arc and the Crossbell arc that still had some loose ends left. And I just cannot wait. I mean, it's my boy Crossbell again amongst other things. I so eagerly want to know how the story continues. I've even peeked into the first hour of a let's play, even though I couldn't understand anything, just to scratch that itch. Please put it into my veins, Kondo Sama. In Japan, the next game after that, called Kuro no Kiseki, Kur Kuro no Kiseki, has already been released and it started a new arc, the Calvert arc, that's the other country that played a huge role in the Crossbell Dilemma and even the next game after that. <sighs> Kuro, no, Kuro no Kiseki 2 
has already been announced and will release at the end of this year in Japan. It's a weird feeling when these games already do exist, but you can't play them yet. In any event, for some closing words, I have to say again that I think that it's really sad and unfair how Trails still is a niche series, more or less. Things became better with Trails of Cold Steel, but Falcom still doesn't get enough widespread reputation, credit and financial success they would ultimately deserve for all the effort and dedication they put into these games. Maybe it's how fate intends it to be, given how intricate the series is and how localization is always something to overcome, but it's callouts like these that at least try to spark some interest in those who don't know it yet. And if I happen to encourage more people to give it a try, then that's all I could have ever hoped for with this video. Thank you very much for watching. Get up, get up,